is stoicism for dummies? Well, yes and no. I mean, stoicism, according to its proponents, is for everyone. It's for freed slaves like Epictetus. It's for the wealthy rhetoricians like Seneca. And it's for philosopher kings like Marcus Aurelius. So stoicism is for dummies and for the learned. It's for the weak and for the powerful. But what is stoicism? That's what we're going to be talking about on this episode. So welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedecase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. This episode is a very special episode. I have with me, Dr. Tom Morris. I tend to think the Stoics often have a great idea, whether on this topic or other topics, they often have a great idea and then they take it to an extreme. He's awesome. I love this guy. I look up to him in many, many ways. And we're going to be talking about his new book, Stoicism for Dummies. It's co-authored with Gregory Basham. It is an introduction to Stoicism, an introduction and overview, but these guys break some new ground in covering Stoic philosophy of religion, Stoic theology, arguments for the existence of God from a Stoic point of view. It's really, really fascinating. It's a fantastic book. I know that you're going to love this episode of the podcast, so make sure you listen to the full episode so you can become an expert in Stoic philosophy. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by Murdy Creative Co., if you guys know me, then you know I love leather goods. I love leather notebook covers, and Murdy Creative is one of my favorites. Right now, I'm partnering with Murdy Creative to bring you 10% off your entire order. So check the link in the description wherever you're getting this podcast at and grab one of these beautiful folios. This is my Parker's Pensies folio. It carries a notepad, two of these field notes notebooks and a moleskin notebook as well. This thing is a beast. I love it. And I think you'll love it too. So again, check the link in the description. If you guys like this podcast, then please consider supporting it on Patreon. You can become a Patreon patron for a bunch of different levels of support, or you can support me on YouTube by becoming a YouTube member. And both patrons and YouTube members get special perks for supporting the podcast. All right. So without further ado, let's jump in with Dr. Tom Morris and talk all things stoicism. All right. So Dr. Morris, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast, man. Always oh, great to be here with you, Parker. It's just to see that great mustache. It's worth the trip. You know? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, uh, like like I said in the introduction here, folks, we're going to be talking about stoicism for dummies. And um, I've gotten some some comments from people who have seen on my social media. I've been posting that I've been reading this book, and they go, "Oh, a, a for dummies book. That's that's interesting. That you're a you know a graduate student in philosophy reading." And it's like, look, you guys got to take the book. Uh, as they come by the author. So like yeah. first things first, you know, look, look up the author and then check out the book based on that, not by its cover or the series it's in. So I can't speak to most of the, um, for dummies. I do have another for dummies book, uh, on philosophy by another great <laughs> author, uh, author. It's also Tom Morris. Um, and I have the logic one, so I can't speak for them wow. all, but I can speak for the ones I have. They're good. Do you, um, you know, do you know the story behind that? How I got involved with them in the first place? I don't think I do. Well, it, it was it was in the mid '90s, and I get a phone call one day. A, a woman's voice says, uh, "Hey, Dr. Morris, uh, can I talk to you for a minute?" I said, "Sure." She said, "I was in your audience last week in Palm Beach, Florida, where you spoke to 2,500 drugstore executives on philosophy." I said, "Really?" She said, "Yeah, my boyfriend's executive vice president of CVS." And he invited me to come to your talk, and it was so great, and I was so inspired. And look. I'm the head editor for all the dummies books. Hmm. Could you do philosophy for dummies for? I said, I wow. said, wait, wait, isn't that something like, you know, neurosurgery for nitwits? I mean, <laughs> what do you mean philosophy for dummies? She said, no, no, no. It's, it, you know, it's a tongue in cheek title. It's, it's like, and I said, you mean like uh, Socrates who believed that we all start off as dummies and the sooner we admit it, the, the better that we can make progress. She said, that's exactly it. She said, we've, I said, but you guys do gardening books, you do car repair, you do computer stuff. And she said, well, yeah, but now we're going to launch lifetime learning in the sciences and the humanities and the arts. And we've gotten Thomas Hoving, the curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, to agree to do art for dummies. If you will agree to do philosophy for dummies, you two guys can launch our new lifetime learning. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, what an honor. OK, yeah, cool. I'll turn my Notre Dame intro course into the book. Wow. So, that's how I got to know them. And three years ago, they had me do a second edition. They said they were asking the best-selling authors of all the dummies books to do second editions. And I hadn't heard from them in two or three, in oh, probably three years, maybe. And then uh, then I got the call about this one. Uh, 
out of the blue, total surprise. So, yeah. ah, that's so awesome. Well, I, I want to hear that story as well about how you got into stoicism. But first, we should say for the audience who are uh, un unfamiliar or, or confused about all the different types of what what is stoicism? What's the core thing that picks out the stoic philosophy? Yeah, well, it, it, its name has pretty much nothing to do with its subject matter, but most people don't know, th know this, that the founder of Stoicism liked to hang around on a big painted porch in downtown Athens in the marketplace, and it was called the Stoa. And uh, so at, at first his followers, his name was Zeno, his followers were called Zenonians, which is kind of a mouthful. <laughs> and so people started referring to him as the Stoics, the guys at the porch, you know, oh, the Stoics. Yeah, I know who you're talking about, yeah. as opposed to the peripatetics who are always yeah. walking around, you know, that, right, that right. etymology. So um, Stoicism just grew up around this sense that there's more to the world than meets the eye. Hmm. You know, th there's more than just the physical universe. That, yeah, there's that, but there's an organization of the physical universe. There's this logos. There's this rationality to things that's de that's deep in things, and 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 the inner is really the foundation for the outer, mm -hmm. and and character is is everything in this world. Inner virtue, inner strength. What well, that we should think about who we are before we even think about what we want to do, because we've got to build a foundation in the soul for all these things that people chase in the outer world. And so the Zeno picked up a lot of ideas from Heraclitus, from Socrates. Socrates was his big hero. And Socrates had that same view. You know, man of Athens, you're a citizen of the greatest city in the history of the world. Why is it all you care about is money and fame? You never pay any attention to the state of your own soul. Hmm. Socrates had no problems with money or fame, but he had a problem with people chasing those things without first concentrating on their own souls. That's what Zeno got so excited about, picked up on and tried to kind of trace it out. Okay, what does that mean? What does that mean for our everyday lives? And so he got followers and um, some some really interesting people were following him. It, it became a kind of a big deal uh, in, in Athens. So their main uh, competitors in the philosophical world were kind of the Epicureans. The Epicureans, the Epicurus found this really garden spot outside Athens where they could just go and relax and enjoy themselves, have fun. Hmm. But the Stoics wanted to be in the middle of things. They wanted to be in the middle of the action in downtown Athens. And hmm. that kind of transfers over into why the Romans got so interested in Stoicism because it was viewed as the philosophy of active people, the hmm. philosophy of people who want to make a difference in the world. Whereas the Epicureans just wanted to enjoy themselves, right? And some yeah. of the other philosophers just wanted to think about the world, to ponder, contemplate. But but the Stoics were all about being active, being in the midst of it all, being in the marketplace. And in fact, you know, who was it? Cicero, who later said Socrates was the first man to bring philosophy to the marketplace. Mm. Well, maybe Zeno was the second. And um, so you got this tradition starting in Athens that ends up in Rome, and we, we've lost most of the uh, original writings of the uh, of the uh, Greek Stoics. We just have quotes from them and other people's later manuscripts, but but the Roman Stoics, um, uh, you know, Epictetus, a slave, Seneca, the lawyer, Marcus Aurelius, Emperor of Rome, one of the great emperors, we have. Uh, much of their writings. And so that's how people get to know stoicism, but it's always about the power of the inner self. Yeah. I, okay. That's, that's really helpful. I think, um, so I've been reading a bunch of the stoics just picking here and there yeah. in, in all the books and in, in your, uh, in your book here. Yeah. So I don't know, I don't remember who said it, but I think it was Epictetus was talking about those who um, go into the philosophy school and yeah. just want to stay. They just want to keep learning. Yeah. And he's like, what are you doing? Wait, no, go back out and use it. You, you Go teach your family. Go uh, help yeah. your, your family flourish by using philosophy. Does that sound yeah. like Epictetus? Yeah, that's Epictetus, man. You got it right. He, he, he uses this great image. He said, you're like a guy on a journey to someplace really important. And along that journey, you find a really nice inn, a really great hotel. You check into it. And you decide, well, why don't I just stay here at this hotel? He said, man, the hotel was not your destination. The hotel was something to help you get to your destination. You come to study with me. You come to school with a philosopher, not as your destination, but to help you get to your destination. It's all about what I call functionality. The Greeks and the Romans, they had this great principle. You don't often see it stated, but you always see it in use. I call it the principle of functionality. Uh which says basically the very few things in this world have intrinsic value, good or bad. Most things, it depends on 
how we use them, right? How they function in our lives. So you always have to have to ask yourself about philosophy. How does it function in your life? Mm -hmm. um, is it going to turn you into this? Uh, is somebody who only wants to sit in your study and read philosophers all the time and never use their ideas. You know, that's like being stuck at the hotel on your way to this great destination. Get out of the hotel and get to where you're going, he was saying, right? Yeah. I get a kick out, out of Epictetus. He has great metaphors like that. And he's kind of like a drill sergeant. You can imagine, you know, Epictetus at Fort Bragg or Paris yeah. Island, you know, yeah. yelling at the recruits. What are we using live ammunition? Of course we're using live ammunition. <laughs> Get on your belly and crawl. You know, he was that kind of guy. Whereas Seneca is more your inspirational, you know, he could have written for Hallmark cards. You know, he's got these great phrases. He's very inspirational, very motivational. Yeah. You, you get the drill sergeant with Epictetus you, with Marcus, you, or Marcus Aurelius, Emperor of Rome, you get something really different. You almost get like an AA meeting. You know, uh, it's like, Marcus, I'm having a hard time. Yeah, me too. You know, he's saying, it, and here's how I deal with it. So, so you kind of feel like, wow, he struggles too. He's this guy, the most powerful man in the world. And, and his meditations, which was not the original title, of course, but just his memoir to himself, his notes to himself, are his daily struggles. Hmm. with the things he wants to get better at, with the things he's not doing well enough, with the things he's forgetting, the wisdom he's not living. And so he's that guy who wants to get himself out of that hotel and he wants to get on the road uh, of making progress toward his true destination in life. I love that the Stoics had these metaphors like this to help us see that philosophy is a way of living. It's a road. It's a path. It's not just a bunch of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool that you can find uh, stoic exemplars at each uh, like uh, level of um, the social, the, the culture, you got the yeah. slave, you got the uh, rhetorician well, yeah. and you got the, the king of the world. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you said um, if stoicism had, or you, you and your co-author, I should mention Gregory Basham. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if stoicism had a general motto, it would be to cope and conquer with character. Yeah. Um, and so I, it, it's cool because you, as you just explained for us, the three figures are either coping or conquering with character, yeah. like probably yeah. both conquering themselves, but also coping mm -hmm. with the the, uh, the world. I, I really, I really appreciated that. that that's helped me um, grasp stoicism a little bit more. Uh, a little I'm bit glad better. to hear that, Parker, because that phrase had never occurred to me. It was my job to write the introduction to the book. Um because I was kind of tuned in with how popular stoicism is now. And so I was kind of surveying in my mind all the different kinds of people I know in the worlds of business, the military, entertainment, sports, who have gotten so excited about the stoics. I said, okay, there, these are such different realms of life and, and really top people in all these areas are excited about stoicism. What do they have in common? And it all of a sudden occurred to me as I sat here that day trying to write the introduction before we had written any of the rest of the book, I said, well, some people are trying to cope with adversity and some are trying to conquer their fields, right? The, the Olympic athletes, the yeah. top, uh, the top football teams, basketball, they, they're trying to conquer, not just to cope. Well, wait a minute. Sto Stoicism helps you do both things and you can never conquer until you learn to cope. And the way to learn to cope is you conquer the things that are bothering you. And, and it's yeah. like all these, this came together. How do you do it with character? Everything is, that's the hub of the wheel for the Stoics. Everything comes back to character. It's the last thing on the agenda for most people in the 21st century. You go to politics, you go to corporate meetings. Last thing people can be talking about is character. Mm -hmm. uh, they be talking, in politics, they'll be talking about policy. They've been talking about their opponents. They're going to be talking about whatever craziness. And in, in, in the corporate world, they're going to talk about profits and what are the risks we face and what, what are the uncertainties that are coming our way. But hardly anybody's talking about character. That's what the Stoics said we've all got to be talking about or we won't get anything else right. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. And there's there's this distinction you made between uh, theoretical and practical philosophy. Oh yeah. And um, I, I study analytic philosophy. You you yeah. came up. You you cut your teeth on analytic philosophy. Yeah. And I would say analytic philosophy is the uh, it's it's analytic. It's rigorous. It's uh, abstract philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's not always as practical. You know that's a that's a fair claim. I wonder yeah. how how did how did you get into stoicism? And you were like one of the analytics of analytics. 
<laughs> I was. I was like the Navy SEALs of analytic philosophy. <laughs> I mean, I was doing, you go to my book, The Logic of God Incarnate, you're going to be reading some set theory, you know, <laughs> uh, subsets and supersets. You're going to be reading some modal, lo yeah, modal logic and modal ontology, essentialism and stuff. You're going to be saying, and I try to explain it all very clearly yeah. to somebody who's a novice in some of these very abstruse technical areas of philosophy. But I remember doing an article for the Philosophical Review called Properties, Modalities, and God, where I discovered some new modalities of property exemplification that nobody was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I go to the American Philosophical Association committee meeting that year in Boston, and a well-known philosopher comes up to me and says, congratulations on your article in Phil Review. I said, oh, thank you a lot. He said, I tried to read it. It gave me a massive headache. <laughs> well, that's the kind of technical work I was doing, right? Right. right. And when you read the Stoics, that's not what you're reading. Now, you do get analysis here and there. You do get arguments here and there. But mostly, you get great advice. So we've come to a point where we think philosophy is mostly analysis and argument. Well, maybe philosophy can be an analysis and advice. Mm -hmm. Maybe most of life, with innovation and progress, most of life is about two things, ideas and implementation. In theoretical philosophy, the ideas are theoretical, and so is the impl implementation of the ideas. You find a new concept, you find a new idea, you put it to work in some arguments about a topic that's controversial. Yeah. Well, in practical philosophy, there's also ideas and implementation, but the ideas are theoretical, and yet the implementation is practical. It's not also necessarily just theoretical, yeah. as it is in theoretical philosophy. So we've lost sight of half the history of philosophy in the last hundred years, thinking it's all just like science, only different. You know, we're, we're building theories, we're testing those theories with great arguments, we're, we're, we're fine tuning the theories in the journals. And philosophy used to be a way of life. It wasn't that the theoretical was unimportant, but that, that there were always aspects of the theoretical that had to be put into practice, or else it was just a free-floating uh, free intellectual enterprise of no practical worth. And so when people were talking about shutting down their philosophy departments in their colleges and universities, they've lost sight completely of the immense practical implications of certain kinds of theory in philosophy that we can't do without. So for me, when I discovered the Stoics, and they weren't being taught when I was coming along, history of philosophy was Wittgenstein and Russell. I mean, <laughs> that was going back historically, right? They didn't even, we had one guy at Chapel Hill who taught Plato and Aristotle, and I never took his course. I was taking philosophy of science courses. We were talking about the logical positivists and Rudolf uh, Carnap and Quine and uh, Saul Kripke and stuff like this. And um, I get to Yale and we're doing the same same sort of stuff. But then I was afraid to fly for nine years of my mm -hmm. adult life, my early adulthood. I'd read too many airplane crash stories. And I didn't get on an airplane for nine years. And then all of a sudden I felt, felt a sense of calling that I was supposed to go to where people were, not mm -hmm. just talk to people who could come to me at Notre Dame, but that I should go to where people were. Well, all of a sudden I'm on 400 to 500 airplanes a year <laughs> in the early to mid 90s from a guy who wouldn't get on one. Uh, people at Notre Dame said, so all of a sudden you think flying is safe? And my answer was, well, all of a sudden I think I'm supposed to do it. Um, so I would take a two books with me on every airplane to distract me from the noises the airplanes make and to distract me from what's going on in the cockpit, to distract me from, uh, right? I'd take an old book and a new book. That was my practice. Mm. Um, and amongst the old books, somehow I found Marcus Aurelius's meditations in a used bookstore or something. Wow. Okay. Um, what's this? So I took it with me to distract me from my fears. These were in the early days. Well, I didn't know that it's like you start reading Marcus Aurelius. The first book, book one, is just thanks to everybody, gratitude to everybody who's made a difference in his life. But then as soon as you get to book two, it's like death is everywhere in Marcus Aurelius' meditation. And so here's a paragraph on death. Okay, maybe I'll skip that one and go to the next paragraph. Well, that one's on death too. Okay, yeah. I'll skip to the next paragraph. It's like, really, Marcus, you're talking about every other paragraph. is on. And so I said to myself, okay, i got to wait till I get to my hotel and I'm going to finish reading this guy. And I wrote up a little summary of his thoughts and sent it around to some CEOs whose companies I was speaking to. And they all wrote back and said, this is great. What is this? We never heard of this stuff. So that's how I discovered 
Mm. Uh, the Stoics, and then I figured out. Wait a minute, there's this guy. He was re re referring to Epictetus. I gotta go read Epictetus. And wait a minute, somebody's mentioning. I saw someplace mention of this other guy called named Seneca. And so pretty soon, I just dove in the deep end. And again, no philosophers of the time, to my knowledge, were talking about these folks at all. Mm -hmm. It was all new. But when I would communicate with the people in the business world that I was speaking to, and I would summarize some of these things I was reading, and they would say, this is great. This is exactly what we needed to hear. I thought, huh, okay. I was asked then to write a short book on Stoicism, so I wrote a book called The Stoic Art of Living, which was very practical facing. All the practical stuff that my CEO friends were responding to with such enthusiasm. I didn't feel like it was necessary to go into the metaphysics, the logic, the cosmology, any of that. And, and as a matter of fact, Parker, people who've, who've gotten so excited about Stoicism tend to be reading recent books, popular yeah. books, New York Times bestselling books, that hardly ever mentioned the theology, the cosmology, the metaphysics, the logic. One of the things Greg and I wanted to do in our book, so the Dummies people just came out of the blue a year ago, January a year ago, and I was planning on writing another book. And they said, hey, do you think we ought to do a book on Stoicism? It's so popular across all dimensions of American life, and we've never yeah. seen a philosophy become this popular this fast. I said, yes, you guys should do it. And I wrote a little one-page argument. You know, Here are the four reasons you need to do a book on it. I didn't know they were going to ask me to do the book. I was working so hard for it. But I, I'm thinking, you know, they need to get somebody to do this. And they said, okay, you'll, you'll be the guy then. I said, whoa, you know, I don't have time for We want you to do it by September. They tell me in January or February, we want you to have it done 384 pages by September. Uh -huh. uh, and whoa, you know, I, I've got all this other stuff. And, and so I call up Greg who was a graduate student at Notre Dame, got his PhD at Notre Dame. He helped me teach one of my intro co courses that was so popular. Mm -hmm. And he did the big book for Barnes and Noble called the philosophy book an illustrated history of philosophy, big coffee table book. It, he's done a, he's done a, a, one of the most, one of the best selling critical thinking books in history. Yeah. So he was a solid guy who geeks out on history of philosophy. Yeah. Uh, I, but I didn't know that at the time. So I say, Greg, you interested in doing um, a book on the Stoics, on the Stoics? And he said, it's so weird because I hadn't talked to him in several years. He says, so weird you asked me. I was in a deep dive on stoicism for the last four months and just decided to write my own book on stoic virtue. And wow. I said, well, let's do, it. let's do a book together for the dummies people. And you can weave in the stuff. You Okay, he said, let's do it. I had never even wanted to co-author a book, but I was convicted of the fact that the world needs a book like this because... You can read really technical books on Stoicism. They'll give you the deep theoretical background, but nobody who's not trained in philosophy is going to make sense of those books at all. Right. Or you can read the popular books, in which case you wouldn't even know that they had a metaphysics, a cosmology, a theology, a logic. And, and I thought there needed to be a representation of the full views of ancient uh, uh, Stoicism and modern Stoicism. And I even said to Greg, look, if we can't do original stuff in this book, I don't want to do it. I, I don't want to just rehash other people's ideas. Uh, even though it's about these ancient guys and their ideas, I want us to be able to find new facets, new dimensions of their thought that nobody's been talking about. And so we said, okay, let's do it. And that was the uh, the origin of this book. That's so awesome. So I, I, uh, I've i been a student of philosophy for like 10 years. Uh, and I, I got two uh, master's degrees in theology, but they were secretly philosophy degrees. I just made <laughs> all my theology professors let me write on philosophy. So it was great. But I, yeah. I, I learned a lot about the Stoics because that's who Paul is talking to in the yeah. Areopagus. And that's who yeah. John's kind of looks like John's trying to reach out to the pagan Stoics and the Old Testament Jews and by using Logos. So I was I was really deep into that. And then I get into my my academic philosophy work and find mm -hmm. that like you, there, there's not a whole ton of people talking about it, but I'm also kind of uh, trying to become a public philosopher. Yeah. And in the public, people on Instagram especially, there's there's four really big ones. There's antinatalism and some continental type stuff. Mm -hmm. There's uh, um, existentialism. That's yeah. huge. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. um, and I get that all the time because I have the mustache. And then there's stoicism. <laughs> and it's like, these are this is what the world is really into. Yeah. And yet everything I'm studying is like, hey, can I throw some logical operators your way? Like, <laughs> you know, so I'm like you, I want to do it all. If, if, yeah. the, if the world thinks this is what philosophy is, 
I, I want to be able to speak uh, eloquently about that, intelligibly yeah. about that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm seeing it. And um, yeah, I'm it's, to... and, and Parker, yeah. that's so important, man. It's so important to meet people where they are, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the one of the big problems of analytic philosophy, which I love, is that it, it becomes a very exclusive club. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, you got to train for years before you'll even understand what we're talking about. And guess what? We don't care if you ever understand it or not. <laughs> you know? We're just talking to each other here. Right. And it's like, no, no. I mean, my image at Notre Dame for my intro class, which was like an eighth of the student body every year I got to teach at Notre Dame. And it was like, there's this big bridge between them and me. And if I want them to cross the bridge to get to my side, I first got to cross the bridge to their side. Mm -hmm. I've got to go find out what they're interested in, what their concerns are, how they think about life. And then I will help them gradually become more philosophical, more deeply reflective, more carefully thoughtful about the things that already mean something to them. So by you looking at social media, the kind of philosophy people are talking about, yeah. I mean, to me, that's not just amateur philosophy or kind of a popular substitute philosophy. No, no. Those are philosophical questions and ideas and conceptions and let's make the most of them. Let's take yeah. the ball and run with it. You know? Yeah, totally. And, and, and um, I'm also getting into getting back into like the, the wisdom tradition uh, lately yes. and, and the Stoics are in there. The, the guys we've oh, already yeah. mentioned, they're, they're well within the wisdom tradition, but something that you guys said in the book was, stoicism and you mentioned this already that it's not just ideas but it's not just uh it's just it's not just aphorisms or uh, epigraphs right. or yeah. it's not just yeah. these nomic statements it's um it's it's acquiring wisdom which i think you said is a state of the heart and the mind can you can you yeah. flesh that out like what, what yeah, is this we, we're at a time where almost where people think that wisdom is catchy sentences you know slogans you could put on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker or something and yeah that that sometimes captures facets of real wisdom but wisdom itself in the most ancient traditions wasn't just about propositions it was about people it was about it was about it was embodied insight for living. It was essentially embodied insight. So it's almost like we've got it backwards in our time. We're thinking, okay, I want to memorize these 20 catchy sayings about life. So in case I need them, like one of the Stoics said, you know, like a, uh, uh, I think Marcus says, like the surgeon keeps his, his scalpels ready to hand. We want to have these aphorisms ready to hand to help us deal with situations. So I'm facing adversity. Well, I got these five Stoic sayings about adversity. They're going to help me change my perspective. <laughs> That's good, but that's not the heart of wisdom. The heart of wisdom is making me a more insightful person, making me a more discerning person, making me a better judge of people and situations and choices, making me a more virtuous individual. If I'm not being transformed by these insights, then I'm just like a parrot or a tape recorder, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it's all about the lived wisdom. Wisdom is supposed to be lived insight, not just articulated insight. That's so helpful. Yeah, I I love that. I've been collecting uh, gnomic statements. I call my pocket proverbs, and I keep them in, yeah. a, in a pocket notebook. And it's it's exactly right. If if I'm just trying to force my behavior to match these, uh, instead of becoming that type of person, instead of yeah. Yeah. ruminating on those ideas to make them part of who I am. Yeah. Uh, then yeah, like you said, it's a, a I'm just chat GPT, you know, walking around spitting out. Exactly yeah. right. And we're supposed to be so much more than that. It's not to diminish the importance of wisdom sayings. It's to properly locate those sayings in the overall ecology of wisdom. Right. Mm. They are the scintillating byproducts of wisdom. They are the stimuli to wisdom, but they are not wisdom itself. That is a deeply personal spiritual state that we're all to work at attaining. Just like you. You with the jujitsu that you're so good at and me in the weight room for so many years, we are becoming, we're transforming ourselves. It's not just a matter of uh, learn this, learn that, learn this, learn that. No, it's more like become this, become mm -hmm. that. And um, everything is geared around transformation. There's this, there's this passage. Well, when the Iliad and the Odyssey I'd read when I was young, but I hadn't read them as an adult. And during the pandemic, I decided to reread the Odyssey. And and then I did the Iliad. But I did the Odyssey four times, cover to cover, in three wow. different translations in a period of a year or less than a year. And I reread the Iliad twice. And I came to realize, I think the Odyssey is about the power of purpose and the Iliad is about the power of partnership. 
But the thing that got me about the Odyssey is the first hundred pages, it's supposed to be about Odysseus. The first hundred pages aren't really about Odysseus. They're about his son Telemachus, yeah. who's left at home. So his dad leaves before he even, when he's an infant, just a newborn. He doesn't, doesn't even know his dad. His dad's been away for almost 20 years. And, and every stranger that comes to town, he says, do you know my dad? Hey, uh, my dad's Odysseus. You know my dad? Is he alive? Uh, is he dead? And so this old man shows up one time. It's Athena disguised as an old man. And so he says, hey, do, do you, where are you from? Do you know my dad? Is he alive or dead? And, and Athena, who loves Odysseus, and she knows exactly where he is, rather than saying, oh, I know exactly where he is, and yes, he's alive, and don't worry about it. He'll be home soon. Uh, she says, well, you know, I know there's a guy you need to go ask named Nestor. He'll know for sure. Mm -hmm. But boy, it's hard to get to his place, his palace. It's going to be, you're going to have to get a ship and a crew. It's going to be a really dangerous journey, but, you know, I'm, I'm confident you can do it. And if he doesn't know the answer to your questions, there's this other guy. It's a little even more dangerous to get to his place, but I think you need to do this journey. And that'll settle your question for you. He says, okay. So I say to myself, well, why didn't she just tell him? Yeah. She knows exactly where his dad is. He thought he needed information. She knew he needed transformation. Mm. That's what Stoic philosophy is all about too. It's not just about information. It's about transformation. Telemachus needed to make a dangerous journey to confront uh, the adversities of that journey and the uncertainties so that he would become a strong man. The Stoics want us to do the exact same thing. We're always coming to philosophy, wanting the answers to our questions, information. The great philosophers want transformation. And once I understood that in the Odyssey, all of a sudden reading the Stoics, I said, oh, this is what they're up to, too. Yeah, the the uh, I, just a, a random note here on the Odyssey that that probably influenced my life more than any book uh, I've ever read because really? I, I had to read it as a kid and wow. there's one there's one line about uh, I think it was Athena one of the one of the goddesses made yeah. Odysseus look uh, heavily muscled so that he yes. would gain favor with with a woman that he needed help from and yeah. I heard that I read that line heavily muscled and I thought that that's my life I want to be <laughs> that person I said you know, in wrestling jujitsu and lifting everything yeah. it's, it's in the back of my head all the time heavily muscled and, and I haven't lived up to it but it's, it's but, but you know we could we could have saved a lot of gym time just appealing to the goddess right <laughs> yeah, that's right that's right well, I wanted to talk about uh so we talked about Zeno a little bit but I want to talk about um another influence on Zeno and the Stoics uh Diogenes and he's kind of uh he he, he makes his way into philosophy memes a lot uh on yeah, the internet yeah. nowadays and uh he's been described I I think it's been attributed to Plato as as saying that uh uh, he's uh, Socrates gone mad, right? Yeah. He's, and he yeah. does some really yeah. wacky, crazy, you know, yeah. gross stuff too. But can you tell us a little bit about Diogenes and how he may have impacted the Stoics? Yeah, Diogenes the cynic, right? Mm -hmm. um, which the word cynic, the translation is the Greek kunikos, dog like. He lived like a stray dog, right? He didn't really care about human conventions about anything he would consider not natural, anything artificial. He wanted to live. In fact, it's interesting because Zeno, one of his earliest phrases was that Stoicism was about living in accordance. And one of his uh, uh, subsequent followers, uh, I think it was Chrysippus said, oh, well, what he meant was in accordance with nature, living in accordance with nature. And that's, that's what Diogenes was like. And Diogenes, they say he gave away all his possessions except a bowl for drinking water. And then one day he saw a, a slave boy drink with cupped hands, and so he gave away the bowl. Wow. He said things like, he has the most who is most content with the least. That's amazing. And uh, so the story is that Alexander the Great came to see him one day, and Diogenes lived in an earthen tub, a borrowed tub, clay tub. He's lying there in the sun. Uh, probably you know, naked as a yard dog, as we say in the South, right? And, and Alexander's standing over him, talking to him. He admires this guy. If I weren't Alexander, I'd want to be Diogenes, he's, he's rumored to have said, you know, and, and, and so because he, his freedom, his, his sense of, of autonomy, and, and he, he didn't feel any pressure from anybody about anything. And he wasn't intimidated by Alexander the Great. And Alexander said, look, tell me anything you want, and I will give it to you. Okay, here's the guy who had conquered the world, the known world at the time, right? And he's saying to Diogenes, whatever you want, just say, it's yours. And he said, okay, could you move over a little bit? You're standing in my sun, you know? So that's that's that. what he asked for. Uh, 
And so, so he was a hero to so many people who were so sick of being of social pressure, who were so sick of being told what they had to do. Like I remember when I got to Notre Dame, some professor took me aside and said, okay, here's like the 10 things you have to do to get tenure and promotion, associate professor and full professor. And I it was this list of things that half the things that sound like things I didn't particularly want to do. And so I just decided, no, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not checking now off that list. I'm going to do my thing. And if they think that's valuable, I'll get promoted. I'll get tenure. I'll get full profit. If they don't think it's valuable. Okay. I'm maybe I'm at the wrong place, you know? So people look at Dodge. He's just freed himself of everything. Nobody's going to pressure. Now he relieved himself in public. We are told, <laughs> right? right, right. Uh, we're told that he did other things in public that most people find a motel six for or something, you know, yeah. that, that, he just, uh, he was this, I mean, Keith Richards is tame. Mick hmm. Jagger is tame compared to, to Diogenes, you know. He just did whatever he wanted. So, yeah, Socrates gone mad, maybe so. But there was something about him that a lot of philosophers were influenced by. The hmm. distinction between the natural and the artificial. And not necessarily junking everything artificial like he did, everything conventional, but but maybe spotting it for what it is, hmm. not taking it to be more than it is, doing it maybe out of consideration for other people, kindness to other people, and not because you think you have to do it. So he was kind of a, a major figure for the Stoics. So basically, if you want to say who influenced the Stoics, it would be Heraclitus, a very ancient philosopher. It'd be Socrates, and it would be Diogenes. And that, that's the big three for hmm. uh, influences on Zeno, um, the, the, his followers, the people who took over the Stoicism after him all through the centuries, and then the, the Roman Stoics as well. They, he was a big deal to them too. Yeah. Well, it's so that's so great. And, and you mentioned in the book about Diogenes and his emphasis on uh, happiness as, you know, the summum bonum, the, the greatest good. And then the Stoics pick that up and, and they say only virtue leads to happiness. Yeah. And yeah. I thought that was really fascinating because a lot of the Stoicism you see today, is more, uh, it, well, whatever it is, it, some of it's half-baked and some of it looks yeah. more like deontology and it's like, hey, yeah. do the right thing. Even, yeah. you know, be be miserable basically, but don't show that you're miserable. Yeah, it's gut it out, right? Yeah. Gut it out. Be, yeah. you know, be a tough guy. You yeah. know, we don't want to hear your complaints. We want to see your accomplishments, you know? Right. It's like this, but again, drill sergeant stuff, right? And, and it's like, no, wait a minute. It was not like put happiness aside. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this was no, you guys don't understand what happiness is. Happiness is this deep well being, it's this deep flourishing that only comes from virtue. The a a Epicureans thought it only comes from pleasure, you know, seeking pleasure, avoiding pain. And the Epicureans weren't like Diogenes, they weren't wild men. They, they actually believed that the greatest pleasure was absence of pain. So don't get involved in anything like drugs or overusing alcohol. That's going to bring more pain, going to bring pain into your life because no, no, no. The greatest pleasure is the absence of pain. They believed it, it wasn't like they were, they were, you know, hedonists in a modern sense that, but they believed that pleasure was the key to happiness. And, and the Stoics said, no, man, uh, it's a lot deeper than that because pleasure can be used well or badly in a person's life functionality again. The virtues are the only things that can never be used badly. I mean, look at look at the ability to, to the ability to confront truth, the ability to take in truth, to confront it, to take it in, to pass it on. Uh, an affinity for truth. That's never a bad thing. Think about courage. That's never a bad thing. True courage. Think about, and you can go through the virtues, it's like. No, no, no. It's not like, oh, it could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. It, by Aristotle's analysis of virtue, any bad thing, to take courage, a response to risk and danger. Mm -hmm. If there's a bad response, it's either cowardice, the too little response, or it's crazy foolhardiness, the too much response. It's never courage, the midpoint response, the golden mean response. So, so courage can never be misused. If, if, if you think somebody's misusing courage, well, it's not courage at all. It's it's crazy foolhardiness. You know, it's the other extreme. It's not a it's, it's a vice, not a virtue. So the the the, the Stoics say virtue is the only thing that's never bad. Mm. All right. So it must be the key 
to what's supposed to be always good, human flourishing, human well-being, eudaimonia, what we translate as happiness, which was not just thought of as a pleasant feeling, yeah. but was thought of as much deeper than that. Now, it's going to, it's going to, the happy person is going to experience joy. The Stoics have a lot more to say about joy than people tend to think. It's almost as if they wanted to remove every obstacle in our lives that keep us from experiencing joy, a natural state. Look at little animals playing in a field. You know, there's this joyousness that we human beings are supposed to have that we've let the woes of the world and all those artificial things that Diogenes was throwing off, we let so much just extinguish the joy from our lives. And they thought that virtue is the only pathway where you can live a joyous existence free of any obstruction, any obstacle, any distraction. And when you think about it that way, wow, what a powerful philosophy, right? Yeah. And so the people who just think, no, it's it's gutting it out, put happiness aside and get, get work done, you know, get stuff done. They, they don't really see the full package. Yeah. Well, so that brings me to some of the uh, some of the more original work uh, that, that you guys cover in the book about uh, it's, it's really like stoic philosophy of religion, stoic theology, yeah. stoic, you know, arguments for God. Yeah. Um, I, I find I find comfort in in stoicism insofar as it it accords with my my Christianity. I, I look yeah. at uh, their view in their logos. I'm like, look, I'm with the Apostle John. I think the logos yeah. is a person I'm, yeah. I'm, I, I get providence and I can rest in, in knowing like. Hey God, I think God's in control, and so I can say, "Hey, this is this is uh, it's going to be okay because I, yeah. I trust in the Lord." I wonder with them, um, you have this section on fate and free will, uh, you have a section on afterlife, on stoicism, yeah. and even uh, God and the problem of evil. I wonder, can you help us situate like fate and fatalism for for the Stoics and the Logos and and God? Because it looks like these three may be distinct things, maybe they're the same thing. What? How do we think about these three? Yeah. Uh... About the God talk, you find there is this vacillation in historic Stoicism between something that almost sounds like pantheism, yeah, a kind of a diffusion of a godliness throughout nature. It's almost as if nature, well, there is a side of Stoicism that believes that nature is God. God is nature. Like the world uh, soul type thing? Yeah, world soul type okay. thing, right? But but the world soul, the soul that could not exist apart from the world, they were thoroughgoing, the Greek at least, uh, uh, Stoics were thoroughgoing materialists. They believe that nothing exists except matter. That's the only thing that exists. Stuff that can be causally efficacious, uh, one thing bumps into another thing. Uh, that's, that's the world they knew, the world of matter. So they believe, okay, so, uh, but it looks like, Matter is organized in certain ways, and it plays out this world of matter in certain ways. There must be something like an organizing force. And so they saw the, it's almost like I, in modern times, I have to use an almost software hardware analogy. So the logos God is the software of the universe. The universe is the hardware on which the software runs. The software couldn't exist without the hardware, but the software is distinct from the hardware, yet inseparable from it. It's almost like imagine the most advanced AI yeah. that any uh, futurist could, uh, could conjure up. God is that to the Stoics, uh, embodied in the hardware of the cosmos, but able to survive. So the Stoics had this view, the ancient Stoics, that... Um, some like some Hindus had, and like some modern cosmologists, there's a big bang, there's a big expansion, there's going to be a big contraction, and another big bang. There's a cyclic view of the universe, and they believe that the, uh, the universe would be destroyed in a fiery conflagration, and then a new universe would be born, but the same logos hmm. would still govern and, and be God over the new universe. And they sometimes talk to the, uh, the Logos as a pneuma, the spirit, the breath of the universe, the, the fiery breath. It was almost, the more you see these metaphors drawn from Heraclitus and others about fire, uh, the more you see these metaphors, the more you start thinking about high energy particle physics. Uh -huh. And what does fire represent? Well, energy. Well, uh, uh, look at what the uh, 20, 20th century and 21st century physics 
has been moving more mm -hmm. in a direction so that the British, you get the British physicist James Jeans 50 to 100 years ago seeing in one of his books, the more I think about it, the less the universe seems to me a machine mm. and the more it seems to be one big thought. Well, here's James Jeans saying, okay, look, here's uh, materialism. These are the things that are real, material objects, right? But modern physics say the more you look into these things, the less physical they are. It's mostly empty space, and it's all these little particles. But the atomists thought the particles were like marbles or something. No, no, no. Um, the particles are made up of other things that kind of aren't particles because they don't really behave like physical objects. They behave more like just pure energy. And what does that mean? Well, and pretty soon you're eliding the difference between materialism and spiritualism and maybe theists forever haven't been talking about something so weird after all, mm -hmm. because when you contrast it with this physical world that let's take that to be the non-weird stuff, and you guys start talking about gods and souls, that's the weird stuff. No, let's look at the non-weird and the more we look into it, the weirder it gets. Mm -hmm. And so there's not that big a difference in, in, the, in the end. So some people who say the Stoics have all these weird views, you know, well, maybe their views weren't so weird after all, because we can come up with these AI analogies and hardware and software analogies and all this. They did believe there was a benevolent intelligence behind everything. Yeah. And that this created a providential governance of the world that we can trust as the backdrop for our ability to accept whatever happens to us. Yeah. Not just because what's the alternative, but because whatever happens will somehow be for the good of the whole. You know, you get this from Paul in Romans, in, in the eighth chapter of Romans, all things work together for good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he says for those who 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 are uh, uh, the godly folks, mm -hmm. and, and the Stoics would say, yeah, anybody who's plugged in with the Logos, anybody who's trying to live in accordance with the Logos, things are going to work out in a positive way for the whole. That means that as a, in a positive way for any part of the whole. Um, so yeah, that was the view. And I want people for in our book, and we try to say all this very simply, yeah. and we tell funny stories and they're jokes and there's all kinds of things. So people enjoy reading the book. But we want people come away from this book saying, whoa, there was a lot more in Stoicism yeah. than we had any idea about. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I love that. And and you hit on some things that I found in my own reading of, of like Marcus Aurelius. I, I read that in seminary. So I had all these oh. theological thoughts going on. Yep. And then I'm, I'm reading this and I'm seeing, oh, wait, Marcus has arguments for God's existence. Yeah. And and no one ever talks about that because that's a little bit embarrassing <laughs> if you're a modern Stoic. Hey, he's talking about God. But then you guys draw those out. And and uh, I picked two, two of my favorites from your list, uh, Rationality and intelligence and yeah. the design argument yeah, um, yeah, yeah can, can yeah. you talk about like what uh, why how the stoics went from those uh phenomena to thinking hey there must be a god yeah i mean the stoics were impressed that the two things that seem to set human beings apart in this world of ours is the degree of our potential rationality not as if a lot of people live that right, right. the right. degree to which it's possible sure. and the degree to which our relationality is possible you know, you don't see squirrels and bunny rabbits building, you know, institutes like banks and, and governments. And, you know, so human beings are capable of everything from the homeowners association, the, the, the apartment building association up to the World Bank. You know, we're capable of all these massive relational kind of things. And the, the Stoics believe that, that those two things, rationality and relationality, are so important. And so, I mean, for a Christian point of view, right, even the Christian notion of God as a trinity, you get relationality yeah, as right. well as rationality, right? And so the Stoics believe that the things that we can easily discern like that are clues or evidences about things not so easily discerned, like design sorts of arguments that all through history, people have said, yeah, your design argument is no good. It's the God of the gaps argument. You know, evolution explains this, that, and the other. But but then you just people reformulate the design argument. Okay, so how are how is evolution possible? I mean, well, uh, let, let's grant you that. Well, how, how did that get started, right? Uh, and um, I remember having a conversation when I was a graduate student once. And uh, there's a bunch of medical people at Yale. They were at a party. And one guy said, I could never be a theist. I could never be a religious believer. I said, well, why is that? He said, it's just, it's just, people believe it because everybody else believes it. I mean, they're just, they're, all through human history, people say, oh, there's a God, there's a God, there's a God. You ask, go into church, ask somebody why they believe there's a God, what my parents taught me. And the, it's just every, it's just a mass delusion. Everybody believes. I said, okay, 
let's talk about confirmation theory and let's talk about Bayes theorem. And this guy was like, what? <laughs> and it was like, okay, what's the, what's the probability that there would be this universal acceptance near universal throughout human history, acceptance of a belief, of something more, if there were no God, hmm. what would be the, what would be the, what would be the probability of something like that? There'd be a, some non-zero probability, but it wouldn't be, really big it could have some survival value but it also could have the opposite you know you become so otherworldly related you know you're no worldly good and and so it's it's mixed but it's not a huge probability well but suppose now the other hypothesis there is an intelligent benevolent being who created the universe who cares about stuff like relationships and rationality well what would be the likelihood that in a created universe brought into existence by that kind of being there would be other beings like that being that he could have communion with and all this. It'd be some positive probability greater than that other probability. And so this guy would say, whoa, 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 nobody ever talks about God like this. I said, well, that's the Stoics. And the Stoics gave, it's not that they had the greatest arguments imaginable about this or anything, right? This was early in the history of philosophy, relatively speaking, compared to now. We've got, you know, I've got a friend who's been working on fine tuning for 20, 30 years. And it's not, it's not fine tuning of the universe with respect to the existence of you and me. It's fine tuning of the universe such that uh, the laws of the universe are discoverable. It's fine tuning concerning discoverability. And this guy was getting his PhD in physics at, with the top guy in the country um, at University of Texas before he decided he wanted to be a philosopher. And so he uses all his physics knowledge to to work on this. Now, the Stoics they didn't have a clue about all this stuff. Right. They would do simpler arguments than you will find now, right? Yeah. And, and in the end, though, you often find the Stoics. There's the longest chapter in the book is probably the chapter on death. Uh, and is there life after death? How should we feel about death? How should we confront fear of death? Stuff like this. At the end of the day, some of the Stoics want to just dump arguments on us like Epictetus. Other Stoics like Seneca and Marcus, they're more the transformational approach to mm -hmm. dealing with death. They believe they seem to believe that there is some form of survival of death, which so is a little bit more like Judaism in the sense that it didn't really play up with an afterlife or, you know, and yet most seem to believe there was at least some afterlife for at least some people, virtuous people. They weren't sure about the other people, yeah. but um, in the end from Marcus and Seneca, you don't so much get arguments that analytic philosophers would applaud and then try to take apart you get sort of a, here, let me help you think about this differently. Here, let me accustom your thoughts to, to dealing with it a different way. A friend of mine says they go from theory to practice to mastery with respect to their emotions. And it's like, oh, okay, I see what you're doing there. It's not just a theoretical thing. You're not just giving me theoretical arguments for the existence of God. It's almost like a Blaise Pascalian thing, yeah. Pascalian wagering. You're trying to accustom me to think in a different way that may open me up to discerning truths that I can't necessarily reach as conclusions of arguments, but that I can grasp once my bad habits are gone. Yeah. That, that to me, that's so good. I'm so glad you mentioned Pascal too, because I, I think of him as being also in the wisdom tradition of, yep. of things. Yep. And, uh, and I just, I just want to do all of that. I want to be both. And, and yep. I, the, the way I was able to conceptualize this was reading, uh, uh, Herbert's uh, Dune, Messiah, the second book. And he talked about a, a, um, a Zen Sunni men, mentat. And a Zen Sunni was like a sage uh, of the desert, yeah. only spoken parables. But in one person, they were trained as a mentat, which is like the logic chopper. So you got oh. this one person who's the logic chopping uh, analytic philosopher, basically. And then you have this uh, sage, uh, the Zen Sunni yeah. mentat. And so yeah. finding those uh, together, that's that's what I want to be. And so I, it's it's really cool to see all that in one tradition that there you, yeah. you have you have the the teacher but you also have the the older brother who's saying hey come yeah. come along with me i'll i'll help you come walk this life and i'll show yeah. you what it's like it's like arguments are not unimportant but right. maybe they're not all important they're not the yeah. only thing that's important and so when you read a range of stoics you get epictetus on the one hand who really loves his complicated arguments and you get seneca who likes arguments, but also likes a good metaphor, likes a good simile, likes a good, and then you get you get Marcus who who sort of moves in the practical mode as well, and you'll still get arguments, 
but you also get he's trying to the whole meditations the whole series of books is him working on himself trying mm -hmm. to get himself to be a wiser person to think more wisely not not in the sense that geez i don't have a good argument about this so i don't know what the answer is maybe there are aspects of epistemology ways of knowing that go beyond propositional argument and that have to do with a deep level discernment that we have to enable in our lives and not block. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Stoics were after. So when Greg and I lay out arguments, we also we always have in mind, yes, arguments were important to the Stoics, but so were other things too. So let's don't get just hung up on the arguments. Let's see what they were trying to do with the arguments. And maybe we will, the functionality principle again, maybe we'll see their functioning in a greater ecology of coming to know. Mm. I love that, and and that's another thing I've I've taken from from Jesus, who it looks like, uh, it looks like he knew when to give an aphorism and when to give an argument. Because yeah. you get some folks who just focus on his argument. Look at Jesus; he's a he's a great logician. So like, yeah, but he also speaks in proverbs that people don't understand. And he goes, "Look, that's it. Have if, if you have ears to hear, then that's it. But right. if not, then sorry." And he yeah. knows his audience, and he and he knows when to give a syllogism and when to give a proverb. And and uh, I want to be like that, man. I want to be that kind of. Well, wise you know, man. he's. He's the great example of what Athena was doing, who, who, who di didn't come just to give information, but came to uh, evoke transformation. And he knows that if he makes some things intellectually easy and keeps you from having to struggle on a personal mm -hmm. level with those things, then you're not going to be transformed. Yeah. You know, and, and it's all about being transformed in, like a Paul has phrases about this transformed in your mind, you know, that, in your heart too. So, so yeah, I think a philosopher can be a master of the theoretical side, but also a master of the, what, what are we going to call the existential side, the practical side. And these things don't need to pull apart. They can be done. They can be done together. In fact, maybe they're best done together that when they do drift apart, problems result. Yeah. Amen to that. Well, so, so bringing up Christ here, um, as I was studying in seminary, I was also in a uh, Calvin class, a PhD class on John Calvin, and this line stuck with me forever. Calvin says, uh, let the Stoics have their fate. For us, the free will of God uh, uh, rules everything. He's talking about providence. Yeah. So I wonder, uh, one of one of my uh, someone in my audience asked me to ask you, in, in what ways do you think Stoicism and biblical Christianity are compatible? And then maybe yeah. in, in what ways are they just not compatible? Yeah, well, I think they're compatible in a lot of ways because of providence and things we talked about. But, of course, in, in with respect to the idea of providence, Christians differ. There are some that would maintain what I would what has been called in the literature uh, the doctrine of meticulous providence, where everything that happens, you know, God is responsible in some way for that detail, right? And there are other people who say, you know, Peter Geach's view, God is the grand chess master, so that, no, God doesn't foreordain every single thing that happens, but God is such a great grand chess master that no matter what we do, he can win the game, you know, uh, it's like a, a chess master in this world who doesn't always know what the novice is going to do next, but uh, it doesn't matter because he's going to win anyway, because he knows every possible move. And, and so some of the Stoics have such a doc seem to have such a doctrine of determinism uh, of what some people would call fatalism that where is the free will? Is there any room for free will at all? And of course, there's a new best-selling book where a, a, a scientist is arguing against there being any free will, but these guys tend to have terrible philosophical <laughs> arguments. That's true. That's and, true. Uh, uh, so it's always been a, it, been a challenge. How do we reconcile free will with what we know to be, you know, the functions of the brain and how the brain is part of a physical universe that functions according to physical laws. Well, the Stoics kind of took it, it, it tended to take it to an extreme, and but still thought that we were responsible for our choices. Now, whether they pulled it off or not is sort of anybody's judgment. Uh, I tend to think the Stoics often have a great idea, whether on this topic or other topics, they often have a great idea and then they take it to an extreme. Mm. Uh, it's like there was this famous movie uh, years ago called Thelma and Louise, kind of one of the early feminist movies, and uh, some famous actors in it. Uh, uh, and these two women on the run, 
uh, leaving an abusive boyfriend or husband, I think of one of them, uh, they end up the last scene in the movie is they drive a car off a cliff you know, on purpose. And it's like, I use that image in the book. The Stoics are always driving the car off the cliff. It's like, you got a great car there. It goes really fast. Don't drive it off the cliff. And I will tell in the book, and I do this in my earlier book, The Stoic Art of Living, um, there are Stoic philosophers who believe you should never feel grief at the death of a loved one. Never. You shouldn't feel any grief whatsoever. Now, that's Epictetus. Seneca is, thinks it's okay to feel a little grief, but not too much. Um, to, uh, but Epictetus is like, no, you know, no. Uh, so a guy across town that you barely know, he breaks a vase. He's distraught. You hear that his vase broke. Are you distraught? Are you hmm. grieving? Are you all torn up inside? Of course not. Well, when your vase breaks, you should be the same way as you were about that guy's vase. It shouldn't affect you at all. Now, transfer that one level more. You know that everybody in your family is mortal. They're like the vase that's fragile. And so every day people in the world die. Are you all so torn up about it? You're crying all day long because somebody on the other side of the world has just died in the last five minutes? No, you're not affected by it. I mean, you know, in some way you know about it, you kind of feel, oh, that's too bad, but, but you're not emotionally distraught. And he says, so when your child dies, when your mother dies, when your wife dies, when you wife, you should be the exact same way as that person in Argentina who just died five minutes ago. That's great. I don't want to say, whoa, <laughs> you're driving a <laughs> car off the cliff here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I try to say why in the book, uh, The Stoic Art of Living. And we try to say why at various points in this book as well, how you can follow the Stoics. They always have interesting ideas. You can follow the Stoics, but you don't have to follow them all the way. Uh, no great philosopher in all of human history has been right about everything. Mm. <laughs> Most have been wrong about a lot of things, yeah. but they are interesting enough to help us see truth. They bring us into the neighborhood of a great truth. And maybe they'll go too far. We don't have to go too far as well. We can stay in that neighborhood of great, of, of great truth. And that's that's how I'm, I'm presenting the Stoics. And Zeno, you mentioned a couple of times, Zeno had some absolutely wild views that most people in the modern literature have not even mentioned in their books or podcasts. And uh, it's like, whoa, really? He believed in these things? If people, well, I'm not listening. We live in an era where people think if Aristotle was wrong about anything, I'm not listening to, to yeah. him about uh, about any other thing. Right. And it's like, wait, it, nobody's perfect. Nobody's been right about everything. Yeah, Aristotle was wrong about a bunch of stuff, but here's the stuff he was right about that's world changing. We can learn how to be selective in our appropriation of philosophical views. And we have to do that with the Stoics as well. Yeah. This was something that, that I was a hard, hard lesson for me to learn. Again, back in, in seminary, once I got to the philosophy, I feel like things were much easier. But in, in theology, it's like, who are you going to pick? Who's your side? What what camp are you in? And I had to learn to, to just eat the meat and spit the bones. Look, everyone's yeah. got a bunch of bones. I'm trying to find, If I'm trying to find Christ to worship and follow in some human being, I'm going to fail every time. I'm yeah. going to fail that for someone else. But I just yeah. eat the meat, spit the bones. It's a good, bad split. You know, no one's all bad, all good. Like, yeah. you can find something good in, in these thinkers. Yeah, absolutely right. And 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 we've got to this uh, and I get it. Uh, uh some of this is is people trying to rid the world of scourges, right? So yeah. if a guy was a real sexist or misogynist or had uh inappropriate views about women or about another race or anything like that, you know, we, we don't want for a second to have people think, oh, well, that's good too. You know, right. or, no, just by being an Aristotelian doesn't mean you agree with him on everything. It's just that you think he has some of the main things right. And like us all, he's a child of his time, right? Uh, he's not going to come up with uh, the Heisenberg principle in, in his <laughs> era or with Einstein's ideas. Uh, so we got to take him as he is and say, what can we use? Again, functionality. And what is just not going to function for us because he was just wrong about that, right? Yeah. And yeah. we got to do the same thing with the Stoics, I mean, people don't 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 even under most people don't even know that some of the early Stoics were, in, at least in theory, cannibals. They were mm. cannibalistic. They believed in the propriety of eating other human beings. Wow. And I, I think I see in the book. I can't remember if it got in there or not. I said, you know, 
it doesn't mean that if Zeno invited you for dinner, you needed to be really scared about it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you had tragically had an accident on the way to his house, he's going to say, well, look, the grill's on, you know, grill's on, you know, but your protein's all protein. Yeah. It's like, wait, we don't. And, and I use that as a crazy example just to shed light on the fact that we don't have to agree with these guys on everything. Yeah. They, they uh, Some of the early Stoics didn't believe in marriage. They believed that, you know, uh, consenting, and it wasn't even consenting adults. If somebody was old enough to even consent at all, it doesn't matter how old they were, doesn't matter what their real family relation to you was. Um, the whole other ethics of sexuality so different from what we accept in modern times um, and we don't have to go down that road with them. You know, yeah. again, they took some principles and drove the car off the cliff and we can say we're pulling back here. That's so good. Well, so, uh, just a couple, couple finishing questions, questions for you here. Uh, something that comes up a lot for me is, uh, like I call myself a philosopher. That's how I'm earning my, my living. I'm teaching, I I'm studying philosophy and I used to not, but now I'm, I'm calling myself one. And, and anytime someone says, Hey, who, how do you get to call yourself a philosopher? I go back to a screenshot of you saying that I was a philosopher. So, <laughs> so I, a little bit of good, uh, good, yeah. good. But, but the, there's a related question about stoicism. Who, who gets to call themselves a stoic? If you, if you are, are there disciples of stoicism today? And would you say if you take some principles you're not a Stoic, but you, unless you take the whole thing whole cloth, or you know, how do we yeah, think about it these? Is kind of interesting about it is an interesting thing about any worldview. There are debates about what you have to believe to actually be a Christian. Yeah, and different people who call themselves Christians have incompatible views about what's necessary for being a Christian. Like some people say, well, you got to believe in the personal existence of God, the bodily resurrection of Christ. You got to believe in this, this, this. And other people say, well, I'm not sure about the bodily resurrection, but I believe in this other stuff. And I'm sure, well, you're not a, well, how do you know that that's where you, and, and it's interesting in Stoicism, it's a little bit that way too. Some of the champions of modern Stoicism who consider themselves Stoics are atheists. Well, none of the Stoics were atheists, uh, the, the classical Stoics. So how do you make sense of so many of their doctrines about total acceptance of whatever happens in the world, loving whatever uh, comes into, crosses your path? Or, well, if it's from a loving God, I get that. Who's interested in my own good? If it's providential, I get that. But if there's no such thing as a loving God or providence, what's that all about? You know. So it is really hard to say. Although in every such case, what's a Buddhist, what's not a Buddhist, there are some core principles, right? And I will let a person call themselves a Stoic if there are enough of, enough of these core principles. A, a, a sizable number of these core principles, virtue is the key, the only um, thing that necessary for happiness uh, is probably one of those. Um, the inner is more important than the outer is definitely one of those. Um, you got to view the universe as somehow... Um, corresponding to or reflective of something like what we talk about as rationality. I mean, there was a Hungarian mathematician uh, who believed in, he wrote an a famous article, I think the title was On the un Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics, yeah, Eugene Vigman. Yeah. Uh, why is it that a mathematician at Princeton University can do can invent stuff on his kitchen table and ends up applying to the world. Why does mathematics reflect the nature of the world? Mm -hmm. This whole thing about rationale, our rationality and the logos writ large, um, there's gotta be some element of that or you're not a stoic. You may have used some stoic principles, borrow some stuff from the stoic. You could, you could borrow some stuff from Aristotle and be a Platonist. You know, you don't have to be a thoroughgoing Aristotelian to borrow some of Aristotle's ideas. I think people have to realize you can borrow from any philosophical tradition without actually saying you're one of them. And some of the Stoics, they didn't care about making other people Stoics. They <laughs> cared about making other people wise. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Well, so uh, finishing up here, you, you in the book, this was really fascinating. You talked about why Stoicism thrived in ancient Greece and Rome. And then you talked about the demise of that. And you yeah. also talked about the, the uh, why, why I think that uh, or the conditions that were set for Stoicism to thrive today. I wonder if you can help us with the demise of ancient Stoicism and then maybe speak to whether or not that might happen today. Yeah, you know, Stoicism flourished. Uh, you get a slave like Epictetus, a freed slave, but his students were all the 
the sons of the aristocracy, basically, the wealthy, mm. the powerful. You get Seneca, he was wealthy and powerful. You get Marcus Aurelius, who had the most of wealth and power, Emperor of Rome. So you get, at a certain point after Marcus, the very thing that attracted a lot of people to Stoicism. It's this powerful worldly philosophy that starts on the inside. But look at these guys. They get a lot on the outside, too. You know, it's this... Uh, and along comes something like Christianity, which was more geared for everybody, regardless if they were ever going to be in a position for worldly power and wealth. And here's this much simpler path where you don't have to wrap your head around stoic determinism. Uh, you can just accept that there's a loving God who is calling you. So it's almost like there were some simpler, powerful alternatives that became widely available after Marcus's time that kind of took the kind of displaced Stoicism mm. because there was a lot of the background, a lot of logic, a lot of cosmology, a lot of metaphysics, a lot of other stuff that a message like the, the gospel didn't necessarily embroil you in all of that, that we kind of, now you go to seminary, you're going to get philosophical theology. You're going to get all of that. Right. Yeah. But in the early preaching of the gospel, there was just a little bit, and it was more thoroughly practical. So that seemed to to, to move ma the masses of people away from Stoicism. There's a debate about whether it was ever popular in a massive sort of way mm. or whether it was just kind of a real popular amongst the elites. Yeah. And look at the people who are embracing it now, like elite Super Bowl teams, elite Navy SEALs. You know, it, it, it's attractive to elites. Uh, but there's more to it than just that. And, and yet you can understand how when Christianity came along with its powerful message, Stoicism starts, starts to recede a little bit. But then along comes, uh, you know, the Renaissance. People are starting to pick up on some of these ancient philosophies and starting to rediscover stuff like Marcus uh, and uh, which was, you know, the meditation is not meant to be a book in the first place. It's amazing <laughs> it even survived, right? This right. guy's personal notes to himself. And, and some of the other folks, we're in a time now where adversity and uncertainty seems to be the most pervasive in modern times. Mm -hmm. And so with a pandemic, with first of all, an economic collapse or near collapse, with a pandemic where everything was disrupted, everything changed, and now with things so uncertain, geopolitically, national politics, uh, AI, the environment. A lot of people are turned to Stoicism because it has this principle Epictetus is always talking about. Two kinds of things in the world, the things you can, can control and the things you can't control. Stop obsessing about the things you can't control and focus on the things you can control. And it's like, oh, really? I can do that? Because all these things that they're warning me about on the news all the time, those are the things I have no control over whatsoever, right? Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Gaza, uh, the looming, is is the AI going to destroy the world? Is there an asteroid with our, with our name on it coming toward Earth? All this stuff, I have no control over that whatsoever. So the Stoics are going to help me sort of reorient my emotional life so I'm not worked up all the time about that stuff. Yeah, let me read some more. So I think that's part of what's responsible in our time. In any time of tumultuous change, the Stoics have kind of resurfaced and especially true in our time. Mm. Oh, that's such a, that's, that's, that's a good word. Well, the, the book again for the audience is Stoicism for Dummies. It's a Wiley brand book, Dr. Tom Morris and Dr. Greg, Basham, Basham. There we go. Yeah, there you go. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I really like, I really like um, you collected things for. So if it's a one-stop shop, if you want to yeah. get into stoicism, but I don't think you're going to be able to stop there because it's like pulling the thread. And now you want to. Well, I need to go read Seneca for myself. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll do that. But then I really, really appreciate the uh, unique perspective that you have because not a lot of uh, interpreters of stoicism will talk about God and they won't talk about their reasons for believing in God. Right. And they won't, they won't give the analysis in a way with hat, which has a joke on the side too. So yeah, right. Yeah. Well, we, we always want to be fully responsible to the history of stoicism, to the theory of stoicism, but we want to have fun. I used to tell my graduate students when they were learning to teach, I said, philosophy is a serious thing, but serious is not the same thing as somber. 
Mm-hmm. You know, the issues of philosophy, very serious issues, big life issues, but we can have fun talking about these things. And you'll see every now and then Epictetus cracks a joke. Seneca cracks a joke. Marcus Aurelius will make you smile. Kierkegaard was big on that. So was Socrates. So so I always have to have fun in what I'm doing. The stakes could not be higher, but we're actually not distracting ourselves from understanding when we're making a joke that's relevant to something. We're going to help ourselves understand it even more deeply. Yeah. They're too important to be boring. And to present there you go. That's yeah. absolutely that's right. awesome. Well, all right, folks, that's going to have to do it for now. Until next time, hopefully I can coax uh, Dr. Morse to coming back on. This is always fun talking with them. Uh, that's going to have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies. And as always, all glory to God.